So we're here on International Menopause Day, and I'm Kirsty Bashforth, Chief Business Officer of Diavarum, and I'm joined by Heather Jackson, co-founder of Gen M, uh, the menopause partner of brands, of which here at Diavarum, we are one of the founding partners. I'm also joined by Lisa Jordan, Managing Director of our UK business in Diavarum, and Rob Chandler, HR Director of our UK business here at Diavarum. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to International Menopause Day. Obviously, we all appreciate that menopause isn't just for one day a year, nor one month a year. It can actually last up to 15 years of anyone in menopause's life. So this is a serious issue right now to understand and better serve it. It is a societal issue. So I really am pleased that Diavium, alongside Gen M, its partner, are really using today as a platform to actually raise the awareness of menopause with everyone and look to support and serve it better. So I think the first question that I think we've got some great people on, 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 on the chat today. And I'd like to turn to, to Kirsty um, to actually understand why Diavir and believe this isn't a side issue for, for yourselves and it's a real societal one. So over to you. It's great to be talking about this on um, World Menopause Day. So Heather, you asked why this is not a side issue for us at Diavarum. Well, um, worldwide, and that is 23 countries that we operate in, over 73% of our workforce is female. And a further 19% of that workforce are women falling within the ages of 45 to 55, which are the prime years where perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms arise and are experienced. Um, we believe that menopause literacy and, and resource access is a, a critical part of our Diavarum's well-being strategy, which we founded in late 2020. And if you put that together with our mission as a company to enable fulfilling lives, and that includes our staff as well as our patient and our true care culture, you put all that together, it's beholden upon us to raise awareness understanding of menopause and provide those resources and, and enable that conversation to be just part of normal discourse and normally part of our culture. Do you actually think as well, though, that actually it's brilliant that companies like yourself are recognising the important part for your, your patients and, 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 and your, your work colleague as well. But actually, if we normalise the conversation and bring, bring companies like yourself into raising it outside of the workplace as well, because even if you do the best policies and the best support, if, if those people in menopause aren't being supported back at home and in the life, it's going to make diddly squit to, 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 the, to their experience. We've got to make the experience of menopause better. But, you know, again, we've got to take that fear factor out of it, haven't we, for women and for, for men. Well, it all starts with health literacy and education and preparation. And I know that you're doing some great things here at Diabirum on that. So, Kirst, did you want to expand a little bit more about your health literacy? Well, health literacy is a big issue for us. It's a societal issue. It's a societal imperative. Renal disease is a growing disease around the world with about a 6% growth on uh, year on year from about 3.5 million patients in dialysis globally towards 5 million at those growth rates in a number of years. And how many of us really know that much about kidneys? We know about hearts. We know about cancer. We know about blood pressure. We know about lots of things, but not many of us really know about the kidney. So health literacy generally for kidneys is a big topic, but it's such a broader topic and it's something that we are really, 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 really focused on. So this for menopause, it isn't only about women. Of course, it's about women and men. But it really starts with women properly exploring the topic as they are going through it and removing their own taboos and own misunderstandings. And also for us as women to understand it isn't solely a women's issue. And that's how we should think about it. It's an organisational issue as well. It's about managers knowing how to support staff, how to enable those conversations. It's about all of us being prepared in our healthcare services to be able to support patients, menopausal patients as well. It's a well-being issue for all, but it's also a productivity issue. Are we thriving at work and able to do our best work? And it's a talent retention issue because at the ages that we're experiencing those symptoms, it's often when we're most experienced and often when we're most senior. And we don't want that talent leaving the organization. We want it giving back, participating, sharing. So I 
think of menopause in a similar way that I think of puberty. It is a stage of life. It is not an illness. It is not a disease. It is not really even a condition. It is a stage of life. 100% of people go pu through puberty in general. Of course, some people don't. But in general, the population goes through puberty directly. And people don't know exactly when it starts. We don't know exactly when it finishes. Some people sail through it as delightful teenagers. Some people are hideous. Some people have horrendous experiences. Same for menopause. It's just that 50% experience it directly and 50% experience it indirectly because women do not operate in isolation from men. And that's how I think about it. It's a stage of life. It just is. Talking about puberty, that brings us on to, on to that. You didn't go to the doctors to find out about puberty. Society brought you up to realise you're going to be monosyllabic, you were going to be spotty, you were going to slam the door occasionally and not be worth being around. Try being that as a 53-year-old woman. It doesn't have the same impact. And actually, menopause is a teenage puberty. And, you know, that is the other big part of this normalising the conversation we've got to have, that, you know, the doctor shouldn't be our first step to menopause at, and, and understanding it. We as a society should be growing up with it, understanding, but reminding people right now, there is no wrong at the moment. This is a learning place for us all. Kirsty and I we're, were the first generation of women to have the opportunity to live longer post-reproduction than pre-reproduction. We're the guinea pigs once again for society. But actually, let's make it a legacy. We need to start talking positively about menopause. We look, stop taking the fear factor out of it and actually look to really respect this age that we're all going to be coming and actually realise we can swing from the chandeliers, we can be the best version of ourselves and we can actually have our careers at the highlights so that actually if we we can thrive, society can thrive, which brings me back to your, your, your smile about the word the change, Kirsty, because actually your mum did call it the change. My mum called it the change and it was looked very negatively. Oh, it's the change. Let's be very quiet on it. But actually, if I was a marketeer, I'd love to rebrand re the menopause as the change because it does exactly what it says on the label. It changes everything and actually if we could learn to embrace the journey of the menopause treat it like just as much as if you're running a marathon you wouldn't just get up off the sofa without any training in your slippers and run a marathon the menopause is the biggest marathon any woman or anyone who's going to be entering menopause will ever go it can last up to 15 years so again we've all got a role to play in this and actually not treat it as a disease Treat it as a transition. You've already touched upon many women will go through early menopause or surgical menopause. That's 10% of women normally. And actually looking at the UK, what Rob's going to talk about more in a moment, it's 15 and a half million women in the UK currently menopausal from perimenopause through to postmenopause. There's 1 billion women globally by 2025 who will be in this transition. We have to start looking at it positively. We have to take the fear factor out of it. And actually what's brilliant about companies like yourself is you have that power of the collective. Your brands with reach that you know influencers can only dream of because if you bring brands like yourself in and look at the reach you've got with employees and customers and, 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 and customers and patients, that is some incredible, you know, reach and influence. So it is your role, which we're proud to say as part of Gen M as our partner. You sit alongside 70 of the biggest brands in the world, and that's growing every day, to come on board, unite, to commit to not only serve and support the menopause better, but raise the awareness of it with society. Because the sooner we raise the awareness, the sooner we recognise that there's 48 symptoms of menopause. And I'll repeat that again. 48 symptoms because at the end of the day if we don't know those symptoms like you said Kirsty how can we expect an employer to support us when we don't know what's going on ourselves there is a role here of women to stop actually being ignorant of the menopause and actually prepare and educate ourselves what you know, my son once turned around to me at 12 years old and said, Mum, what can you teach me that the internet can't? We've all got an ability to find that information. So, you know, let's not look at blaming society. Let's stop blaming the doctors. Let's stop blaming the workplace. Let's all accept we can all do better in this. And that's why diarrhea can re really up the ante. I think there's, there's, there's very little excuse for us not to be very comfortable with it. Is We are a healthcare services business. Our staff in all our practices, 
are healthcare staff. They are clinically trained. Why would it be odd that we talk about the menopause amongst our workforce? Why would it be a taboo subject when every day in our clinics, we are dealing with all sorts of challenges and conditions that for those people who aren't patients may normally be taboo subject. It's, it's, it's a sort of illogic that we wouldn't be comfortable talking about the menopause. We are a global organization. We're not just one country, and therefore we believe we can make a, um, an impact in very many places. But we want to start, or rather the business that's wanting to start fastest in our organization and get out of the blocks and really get tangible is the UK part of our business. As I say, one of 23 countries. And that's why we've got Rob and Lisa with us today to talk about what the UK part of our business is actually doing and getting into practice on it, it is it's a very fascinating time to be talking about this because on international menopause day it is a subject that is widely regarded as a as a taboo subject and it is correct to think that within healthcare we have lots of conversations that are bordering on the taboo um, our patients um, that we see regularly throughout the week have multiple health issues themselves and this is about ensuring that the society challenges that we have that overlap with our workforce are dealt with this, this isn't about our workforce in isolation it's about the role that we all play and I know that Heather you've mentioned this in times and it's interesting when you think about it that way because you do play a different part in the conversations that you have in your particular circle of, of family or friends or work come to that, I think it's important that you demonstrate that you can have a conversation around what is regarded as a taboo subject and you can, as you said, normalise that conversation. Why can't you have a conversation about this? Every day we are discussing the health of our patients and how that those health issues are treated and, and that can come that can become some very difficult to talk about you know, you're talking about end of life and things like that which is you know which is really difficult so this is another societal issue and it's another topic that we want to enable our staff um, to talk about because it's something that we will all impact on at some stage in our lives and, and actually, Rob, you're completely right there. But we've also got to remember that menopause impacts all directly or indirectly. And regardless of gender, ethnicity, sexuality, it absolutely impacts all because, you know, the highest rate of suicide is women in this period of time. So, you know, you come from a family that's had a suicide and it, it's a massive impact. You know, at the end of the day, the highest rate of relationship breakdowns is in this period of time as well. If you're going through a relationship breakdown, man or woman, and you're coming back into the workplace you're not coming back your best self either right now you know there's the pressure on there and actually if as the results are to be seen that despite all the changes we've done to culture to encourage more women to go to the top we actually even in the best culture of companies we're still losing women in this group now because of the menopause this is impacting financially the families but equally financially and economically the world because we need that talent there we need the balance we need to drive forward so you know let's not any one of us think that this is a gender or a medical issue you say it's a health issue it is but it's a health issue that has massive impact on everyone right now we definitely definitely don't see this as a women's issue we see it as a workplace issue and you know to your point earlier um it, it impacts um, women directly, we actually skew slightly higher than the percentages that Kirsty talked about globally. We're about 80% female as a workforce here in the UK. But regardless, um, you know, of, of whether we're talking to our male population, female, um, it, really everybody's got a mother, sister, wife, you know, um, somebody, knows somebody who is going through this. And it can impact men just as much as women. Um, and that's why we're trying to be as inclusive as possible as we have the conversation. What's really fascinating, um, and you know, we've been talking about this as a board in the UK as part of a much bigger well-being program, is when you actually go out and talk to our great teams in the clinics and our clinic managers and different levels and different genders and so on. Um, 
The issue is people aren't aware of, of the menopause enough. Even people who are directly impacted, they aren't aware of those 48 symptoms that you talked about earlier. Um, so there's an education piece there. But when you do talk to people who are brave enough to have a conversation around, I'm struggling and this is an issue, um, they say that they don't know how to talk about it and they don't know who to talk about it with. So I think it's it's not a willingness issue. You know, as, as Kirsty said, we're in healthcare um, by nature of, um, you know, what we do and our teams do. They care about um, individuals, whether it's their own colleagues, whether it's our patients. It's actually, I think, equipping people in how to have the conversation. That's the critical piece. So the willingness is a great tick for us that, you know, that's there in spades, um, which which is brilliant. Um, it's now about the programme we're building is making sure that people are equipped with the right education and we have the right policies in place and we're doing the right training and we've got the right toolkit behind the scenes and providing the right opportunities for people to have conversations. It's really funny. We we had a, you know, we've started off talking about this as a board quite some time ago. We've been very supported by Gen M. Uh, which I know we thanked you for, but publicly thank you for the support we've had um, because you have been able to share with us others' journey um, as they've gone through this. And the best practices that you've shared from many industries has been second to none. So we haven't had to reinvent the wheel. In fact, we've had to be very selective in what, we, <laughs> what we've reused as an organisation. Um, but even having all of that support the conversations can be quite awkward. You know, we've had conversations as a board saying, right, let's go into this first conversation on menopause. It's going to be a bit awkward and people might feel a little bit uncomfortable. But until we break through those conversations, we won't get to the part where it's normalised and it's easy for people to have these conversations. So not saying that we are fully there, but our plan, um, which is very much taking steam at the moment and moving very quickly um, incorporates I think a lot of the elements that we need to normalize the conversation give support to our people and also equip the rest of our teams to have conversations and not you know break that taboo that I think everybody's talking about so uh, yeah it's exciting times exciting it's certainly, it certainly is exciting times and before we go in to look at the actual detail of what Rob and yourself are doing in the UK as that pilot to hopefully roll it out globally because as we said 51% of the world's population will one day whether they like it or not enter menopause at some stage of their lives we can't hide from that fact anymore we live to that stage we want to be the best version of ourselves and so again let's Let's also just talk a minute before you go on to talking about what you're doing inside is that just to remind everyone on, who, are, who are listening to this, not, that not every woman's or anyone in menopause's experience is bad. You know, we've got a lot of fear factors this last 18 months on, on, you know, I've already mentioned the word suicide and things, but actually, you know, our research shows that most women will say, my menopause isn't that bad. But in a 21st century, we believe not that bad suggests it could be better. And yeah. so this is not about just the worst case of scenarios. Everyone going through menopause deserves to have a great menopause, deserves to take control and have choice on how they manage their symptoms. Because like I said, not everyone's menopause is the same. That's the other complication here. You know, it's not like pregnancy where there's nine months and we know what's going to happen in certain trimesters and everything else. This is absolutely up to 15 years of someone's life and they could get all 48 symptoms or they might only get three or they might not get any. You know, so we have to actually have agility and flexibility here to realise that. There is no one way to solve this, but equally, just having a policy that encourages people to nip down to the doctors and get some HRT is also not the right way to go forward as well, because we need to have a holistic approach to this. Not everyone can take HRT, not everyone wants to take HRT, but equally, just as much back to that marathon experience, we want to have our best system. So if we are going to go through a hot sweat, how do we accommodate it? How do we get better bed linen that will help us through it? It's not about alleviating or 
getting rid of the menopause. It's all about helping one another, whether it be our partner, our friends, our family, our work colleague, to help us support ourselves better through the experiences we may be having. So what is it that you're doing right now within the UK to actually kickstart this and actually really give us an ability to go global with you? Yeah, you know, I think that the programme started off with a very basic, what is the menopause? Uh, and that sounds, you know, sounds a bit obvious, but I think people have different understandings of what the menopause is, to, to your point. And there's some really old school, um, you know, going through a change, you know, hot flushes, that's all it is, a bit of moodiness kind of thing. So we wanted to dispel some of those myths and make sure that people are educated to understand what it is. I then think it's around not just understanding the symptoms, but understanding the symptoms that can impact people's work. Um, because, you know, out of those 48 symptoms, you're right, some people will have a select few, some will have all, you know, and, and the impact to individuals in the workplace will vary greatly. But by educating people that there are symptoms and that some of those symptoms, such as fatigue, hot flushes and so on, um, you know, lack of concentration can really impact people in the workplace. That's an important part of the education process. We do need to value ourselves more now and put ourselves, our health and the fact that we are a great asset to the country, to the companies that we were involved with and to our family and our lives and to ourselves higher. We need to take care of ourselves through our menopause. We need to take the right nutrients, the right supplements, the right exercise, the right eat the right food, wear the right kit to, to accommodate, be the best version of ourselves. But equally, this is our time now to thrive, but we can't do it by actually just grinning and bear it and absorbing the menopause. We have to embrace the menopause and get take out of it what we need to do to take control of our menopause. And please don't think yet, yet again, I'm pushing it on women back to our problem. It's not our problem, but it's our issue that we need to get society to support better. And the only way we can do about it is talk. But equally, the last 18 months of menopausal conversations in the world, we all thought if we talked more about menopause, that would be the answer, raise the word menopause. It's like anything, though. It's how we raise it. And actually, the very way that it's been raised over the last 18 months has been very toxic. It's been very blame cultural. It's been very fear factor when actually we need to change the rhetoric now, which I hope that we're going to be able to do with yourselves into a very positive. How do we embrace it? How do we thrive through it? And how do companies, employees, work managers, line managers not fear this, but actually get actually realize, wow, I've got some great women in my team who possibly could be going through menopause. But if I help Help support them in the best way they can they're going to be absolutely incredible for our company and that's where we need to get to now so Rob I think it's time for you to have a bit of a conversation so how would you like to take the next section well I think I think partly I'd, I'd like to talk about some of the topics that were mentioned before about the kind of healthcare and society I think in what we're doing in having a, a kind of a, a well-being approach and well-being policy, and part of that is obviously the taboo subjects of which, of which obviously menopause is is one of those. It's about showing a pathway th through this particular experience, and 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 the parts that we play with that, how we can support people going through it, the people that may have gone through it, who can look back. I think that's a very powerful message where someone has gone through it and can look back and say well this is what worked for me as you mentioned earlier Heather it's different for different people so so one size does not fit all so therefore part of our approach to this is to make sure that we can um, have a good and meaningful conversation so that that person feels supported but also has the right information be it statistical or be it in relation to someone who's gone through that journey, or even someone who's about to go through that journey and feeling that kind of um, camaraderie, if I can put it, to, to kind of go through that journey, but go through it with other people, because it's a, it's a, you know, it's a long, it's a long journey. It's, it's, it's years basically, and to make sure that you go through that and experience the symptoms together, and are able to have those conversations. Being that we are in healthcare, one of the other challenges is in how it is recognised within the healthcare environment. You know, your individual symptoms don't always um, become um, diagnosed as a kind of a, as, as a menopause approach. It could be, you know, it could be something else. So there's a there's the aspect of how long it takes for you to get 
meaningful or even correct um, uh, solutions to, to what you're going through, basically. So I think making sure that we have those conversations and that people who are going through have gone through it um, can play their part, I think. So that's partly what we're trying to do with our well-being policy is to start people talking because that journey is quite different. Yes, we will have a number of different things that they can use, uniforms as well as sort of working practices, but it's about it's making sure it's making sure that those people know that we are supporting them through that individual journey. And to be honest, Rob, the research that we've done with our other partners of, of Gen M, those 70 other brands that are on board with us right now, is they recognize that actually if we start with normalizing the conversation, then their work colleagues come up with some great solutions. I mean, we did we did a call with, with your teams the other day and actually what they came up with was some incredible initiatives and ideas. We've got to stop thinking we have all the answers. You know, we've got to use everybody else's answers here because no, it's a learning process for us all. So I think that's the other part of this that, you know, it's a starting process for everyone. But we do need that buy in from everyone to be part of this and help help really engage this conversation further. Here at DFRM, we joined um, with Gen M as partners uh, in December 2021. And it's with Gen M that we hope to really play our part in changing the conversation globally. We are 23 countries. We are headquartered in Malmö in Sweden. Um, and we recognize absolutely that the evolution of this conversation is very different across the world, very different stages from quite progressing towards maturity to hardly even started and deeply uncomfortable for some people in some places. So it's exciting actually that um, in across our 23 countries, the UK team has taken the initiative to be the first mover to really think about bringing this tangibly to the lives of our staff and thereby because of our interactions with patients to our patients, but start with our workforce and how bringing life to the menopause conversation can really start that conversation change across the world. So this is a big uh, this is a big subject for us and in an area that is known as taboo and has been identified as being a challenging conversation I realize I still have a very important part in this because I am supporting where I can in the roles that I have I think it's very important that we prepare our staff to go through this particular journey and it's important to understand that we all have a role in that preparation and supporting our staff through the journey. The reason we started this journey here in the UK, um, it obviously began with our partnership with uh, Gen M and a lot of information being shared with us. Um, so we started with a, you know, why do we need to go on this journey? And Heather, there were some pretty frightening statistics that you shared with us um, around the menopause and, and, you know, specifically what was happening in the UK. Um, you shared things like 63% of women were seeing uh, symptoms that were having a, a serious impact on their work. Uh, you shared that 30% of people were taking sick leave because of the symptoms they were facing. And that one in four, I think this was the most alarming, one in four were considering leaving their jobs because of the symptoms they were facing. And that feeling of isolation and not knowing where to go and not knowing how to deal with this. So we were you had our attention um, at a very early stage with some of those alarming statistics. And we got together as a board and as a leadership team and started talking about why we felt we needed to go on this journey. Um, some of it was really obvious, it was the right thing to do. Um, you know, as we've said, it's a workplace issue, not just a women's issue, and it was the right thing to do. Um, but really, we know there's a massive war on talent uh, here in the UK, specifically with nurses right now. So we were really looking to do as much as we could for our teams to retain our talent, uh, to retain that knowledge and that, that high level of experience that we've got across the clinic. We were really focusing on becoming an employer of choice. Uh, so getting this right allows us to attract uh, the right the right types of people and attract more people because we are there supporting our employees and it really just allows our you know it, and that allows our teams and enables them to perform at their best 
um, you know, really allowing them to communicate openly, confidently about something that is a significant issue. And the more we kind of um, went into this, we also, you know, that list just grows and grows, uh, you know, the reasons why. And it kind of ends in some scary place, uh, you know, places when you start to talk about legislation and what is happening from a legislation standpoint. And, you know, simply saying things in the workforce like women of a certain age or hot flushes or managing situations differently where, you know, you've got absence warnings being issued to people who've taken time off for symptoms and so on, can get you into some really, really difficult situations and can be considered as harassment or direct or indirect discrimination. So we were sold on the reasons why. Um, and in fact, it became such a serious uh, list of reasons why that that, um, that really pushed us into action. Lisa succinctly said that, you know, you dive here and want to be an employer of choice. I actually want everyone on this call to be an employee of choice as well. And actually understand that menopause and the raising of the issue and supporting of menopause isn't just a workplace issue. It's more than a workplace issue for Diavirum because it's a business issue. It's about and it impacts every one of you in this business, whether you're in marketing, whether you're in comms, whether you're in DNI, whether you're in health, whether you're in merchandise, per policies, products, you name it. You have to understand this audience better. But equally, it's not just a workplace or a business issue. As we've touched upon, it's a societal issue. And as a societal issue, we all have a role to play. We all have a role to play in raising the awareness of menopause. And actually, we've all got Facebook. We've all got our own Instagrams. We've all got our own Twitter accounts and LinkedIn accounts now. If you only do one thing after this, this event today on the 18th of, of October, as today is, can I ask that you actually push out on your social media, you set yourself a task of raising the awareness of the 48 symptoms, link to our site, www.gen-m.com, which has the 48 symptoms on there. Raise this issue, this 48 symptoms, because until we raise the awareness of the symptoms and the menopause, we can't actually start to really do the great things that we need to do to change. So please, just as much as I'm a great believer, I, I've loved some great women in my life and admired them and the way and Anita Roderick once I was in a, a conference and she said the, the founder the former founder of the of the body shop the late Anita Roderick once said if you think you're too small to make impact try sleeping in bed with a mosquito now I know that's not the best analogy out there but it's so true do not think that this is di down to Diavirum or down to the 70 brand partners of, of Gen M to make this change or those great celebrities out there and influencers who are doing their best and the medics. This is down to you as well to make the change that we want to see. So be proud of the company that you're working for. But today, get off this, this video and be proud of yourself as well and what you're doing to change the rhetoric around menopause and drive real change to the change. So happy 18th of October, happy World Menopause Day, but actually let's really have a happy next year, 364 days a year, and let's really understand this audience better and serve them better because they deserve it. Thank you.